The following message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. Well, the missions conference is, is over, but the biblical exhortation certainly remains to maintain the good works. Our, our works, good works that we're maintaining didn't stop when we came up here and put cards on the altar and said, okay, I just write checks for the next 52 weeks or 12 months or however you do it. Uh, certainly there's uh, works to continue and maintain. Uh, we were obviously in the conference a lot in the book of Titus, in Titus chapter 3, where we got our, our text and our theme from verses 8 and verse 14. A few weeks before the conference, Pastor Sargent, in introducing the theme, preached uh, at least one message, if I recall, from that text on that theme. Then during the conference, several of our preachers, uh, Brother Josh Hauer, Brother Corey, how do you pronounce it? Chartier. Amen. We all prayed before he got here for Brother Chartier or something like that. Then we found out how it was really pronounced. Uh, uh, he eventually got to uh, the book of Titus, and Brother Chris Majors uh, touched on Titus chapter 3. But the more I've kind of... Uh, thought about the the theme of the conference and the the book of Titus, I've thought, you know, we don't have to stop preaching from Titus just because the the missions conference is is over. So I've been in there and and looking at it and reflecting more on on that particular text and the book as a whole. And so you can start to turn there as we think about this particular book. This is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to Titus there on the island of Crete, someone said it, and I know looking out, there are at least a few of you that have been to Crete, uh, likely connected to the Navy, likely to Suda Bay, even either you're pulling in there on one of those big haze gray things, or flying into there, amen, to the airfield, and maybe going for dinner down to Hanya, the, the largest city in that part of the island, which is uh, north western side and so I want us to even before we get into the text just start thinking what is that what is the context for this letter Uh, where is it it's we're talking eastern Mediterranean Uh, if you if you take the country of uh, the North African coast Libya where it meets Egypt that dividing line and kind of roughly head north into the Med eventually depending upon how straight your line is, you'll, you'll hit the island of, of Crete. When was this particular letter written? We don't know. <laughs> From where was this letter written? We don't know. <laughs> we can take, uh, make guesses, but even just in studying that, uh, just the background of, of this epistle, I find it interesting that as much as we know about what the Apostle Paul was used of the Lord to do, there's so much more that was going on in his life after he got saved and started serving the Lord that we don't know about. That when we try and piece together where he was at different times, and in particular where he was and uh, when he was writing this letter, we have to kind of put some of the pieces together, but they're not all all there. So... Uh, as John testified of the Lord, there's so much that he did that we, we can't compile it. it would, the books would fill the world. Paul's maybe not on that scale, but there's so much more uh, evang- uh, evangelistically that he did that we don't know about that I find that mind-boggling um, that God in the book of Acts, for example, in the letters to these various churches is giving us somewhat of just a, a, a glimpse. So what do we know about this this letter? Well, again, it's It's written to Titus there on this mountainous island of of Crete. Um, Beautiful, beautiful uh, water that I recall from when I was there. It's about 30 miles wide, 150 miles long. The uh, natives on this island seem to be related to none other than the Philistines, and I don't know what you think of when you think of the Philistines. We don't think of hmm, good, godly, charactered men. Uh, neither do we think of necessarily men of good character 
on the island of Crete. So there's this connection of maybe they got in their boats and they went over and said, hey, this is a neat place to live. Let's stay here. So there were uh, the, the Cretans have at least some Philistine blood in them, if you want to look at it that way. We know there was a Jewish population there based on reading through this letter. How many of those were saved? We don't know. If we go to the Peter preaching in the day of, uh, on the day of Pentecost there in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 2, uh, and the big long list of all the different people that had come from different places, you'll see the Cretes or the Cretans that are there, Acts chapter 2 and verse 11. How many of them listened to Peter's preaching uh, when they were there for the, the Passover, peace, uh, Passover feast? How many of them heard that preaching and, as it says towards the end of chapter 2, were uh, convicted of the Holy Spirit and say, you know, what should we do? And, and Peter says, repent. And uh, were there some Jews there from Crete that went back and, and were part of a saved Jewish population, uh, population? We don't know, but we know there's some Jews there. We do know this. The island of Crete had been well evangelized. Well, how do we know that? This letter, Paul's saying, hey, Titus, I left you there because there are people that are saved in this city and this city. And he didn't say it that way. In this city, he said, we need to organize some churches and, I'm, and uh, you need to fill in the things that are, that are lacking here and, and, and guide the, each of these different churches in different cities to, uh, or mission works, if you will. You need to guide them to uh, ordain pastors, elders, and that's one of those places where it says plural in every city. So it would be one of the clear teachings of a plurality of, of elders. So we know that the island was evangelized and people were saved and not just in one city. How many cities? I don't know. We don't know. It just references a plurality of cities where these plurality of elders would be ordained in the various uh, churches. So we know that. So uh, prayerfully... If you've been there, your mind is, boom, they're on Crete eating, eating some good Greek food, uh, downtown Hanya or, or at the Suda Steakhouse down in the town of Suda on Suda Bay or, or somewhere else. I do recall uh, going for a hike on the island. Most of my time was busy, 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 Navy, 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 so I didn't get to play tourist a whole lot. Uh, but uh, I did have one pilot that grabbed me, took me out of the office, made me go hiking with him up some mountain and tried to kill me by having me fall off. Not on purpose, but he was younger than I and much more nimble. So I, uh, I, can, I can think, I can see, I can, I can picture Crete, and I, and I hope, pray that uh, in, in some part you would just have Crete in your mind as we uh, start off reading uh, the first five verses, I gave you plenty of time in case you were just on a Wednesday night, you're going slow and you can't find Titus. It's uh, after First and Second Timothy and b before Philemon. And if you're in the larger epistle of Hebrews, go left until you get to Titus, jumping over Philemon. So let's read the first five verses, or I will, as uh, I did, uh, encourage you to follow along. The Word of God says this at the beginning of this letter. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life. And, uh, you know, chapter 2 talks about the blessed hope of the Lord's return. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised, when? Before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. And just a little pause there. We'd point out that uh, the end of verse 3 references God our Savior, and the end of verse 4 references Jesus Christ our Savior, do a little grammatical mathematics there, and you come up with none other than Jesus Christ being God. So just pointing out uh, the deity of Christ there. And then verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. 
And I know that's not a period, the end of a sentence, but we're going uh, we're gonna to stop there. So looking at uh, these opening five verses and connecting them with chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 14, the two references over there to maintaining good works, simply think of uh, the charge at the beginning of the letter to set things in order that were wanting and then connecting that towards the end of the letter with uh, once those things are set in order, the maintenance of those uh, good, uh, good works. Our annual missions conference is somewhat like a commencement. You'd say, what do you mean? Well, thank you for thinking that in your minds and asking in your hearts, hmm, how so? Well, a school commencement, uh, whether it be K through 12, like a high school or, or college, marks the end of some period of, of schooling and instruction, and at the same time, hence the word commence, commencement, it has uh, the thought of starting what is next in life. And I would say our missions conference is uh, somewhat like that in that it marks both the end of a period and it looks forward to what is next. Uh, the looking back, what we've finished up, it reflects back on a year of God's faithfulness and his grace financially, $321,000 dollars given towards world evangelism. I know we've said that from the pulpit a couple times, but it bears repeating not not to pat ourselves on the back, but just to look at God and say, go God. <laughs> uh, for those that have been in the church a while, you might recall how excited we were uh, the first time where the annual giving was over $100,000. That was mind, mind boggling. And then however many years after that, $200,000 in one year, where is that coming from? Now, $300,000, where is all that coming from? God, thank you. So we reflect back on God's faithfulness and grace financially and uh, evangelistically. The doors that have been opened and souls that have been saved here in our state and over in the Philippines and in Fiji. So there's a sense of a missions conference, again, being a commencement as in that it kind of finishes up a period of time, but then it commences the new missions year. We look forward to future labors and setting things in order that are wanting and maintaining good works. And we, we dare not sit here and just kind of reflect and look up for the Lord's return Think of Acts chapter 1 where uh, we have that final, well, uh, now someone's going to call me on that. After Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if we would say Acts 1.8 is the fifth giving of the Great Commission, we could say this fifth and uh, final giving right before the Lord lifts up from the Mount of Olives. And he lifts up, you know, he says, you know, radiate out from here, Acts 1.8. And he lifts up and they just thought, and they're looking, and they're looking, and, and what did the two men in, in white apparel say? What are you doing just standing here? There's work to be done. It's not exactly how they said it. Uh, they said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. But don't stand here and just wait for him doing nothing. <laughs> he told you something to do now. Now go do it. Well, uh, that's kind of what I see here in Titus, just this, okay, the missions conference is over. Now what? We don't put Titus aside. What more can we learn uh, from this book to be encouraged to, to press on? And as I studied it out from uh, well, mainly chapter 1 and kind of jump into our text in, uh, for the conference in chapter 3, I believe Brother Josh Hauer was in chapter 2 for the conference uh, when he had opportunity to preach. I see uh, a few things I'd like to look at tonight by way of outline. First off, uh, a relationship. A relationship just in the beginning of the letter. Paul saying, this is me, and I'm writing to you, Titus. And we'll look at that a little bit, just the relationship between Paul and Titus. At this time, uh, Paul was not where Titus was. So he was writing, representing, you could say, the authority of the sending church, and he's writing to someone that was there on the field. So we're going to make application of Paul communicating and developing this relationship 
with someone on the field with us communicating with any, any one of our Baptist outreaches in different spots on the globe and the people that are ministering there. So we'll have relationship. Then uh, this really struck me, just supernatural salvation against all odds. As you read, just, just read the letter. You don't have to do any outside. You, you can stay right in Titus and just read through there, even just the, the opening uh, chapter, and get a sense in your mind what kind of mission field this was. Not, uh, you know, not the mountainous climate and what it looked like, but, but the people. Uh, the people they were trying to reach, these Cretans, these Cretes, somehow related to the, the Philistines, and we know we're somewhat familiar, I think we'll look at it, the, the description of, of them. Uh, so think about that. I think about, you know, th- thousands of years later, the time that I spent there, one small sample point, but uh, I was uh, running a detachment site and we had a bunch of rental cars. And for years and years and years, our particular squadron at that detachment site was renting all their rental cars from one particular company, which was owned by one particular man who wined and dined. He didn't wine, <laughs> wine me, but he dined me. He took me out to dinner every new uh, officer in charge of that particular detachment of that particular squadron. So part of the turnover is, well, this particular gentleman uh, runs the rental cars and you're going to have to deal with them and uh, uh, we'll introduce you to him before I leave. And he's going to want to take you out to dinner and then when a car breaks or you need a new car, this is who you deal with. So went out for dinner early on in, in my period being down there, trying to figure out how to keep planes flying and carry out missions and all that. Had my dinner with this this gentleman, and he shows up with his very young personal secretary. And I'll maybe just leave it at that. It was very awkward for me to have him sitting there with this young female personal secretary there seemed to be some sort of relationship with this married man with children at, at home, and he thought, didn't seem to think anything of it. It was a very awkward dinner for me, and I couldn't wait to just get away from him and hope that I didn't have to deal with him for the rest of the time, that our rental cars would just run and, and I would deal with that. So when I read the description in here, this probably not, uh, I know nothing more about this, this man, if he was a native Cretan. But I think about that and just the, the, the base character of, of the one person I had to deal with in a financial dealing uh, there. And then we'll, we'll look at it a little more. I'm supposed to just be giving you the outline according to my notes and I'm jumping ahead into the preaching. But I, I just want you to think about the mission field here, the character of the people as described in Paul's letter to Titus, the false religions that were there, Uh, the empty false teachers, the deceitful false teachers. And if you were doing a report to your church, hey, we're thinking of going, having a a Crete Baptist outreach or an East Med Baptist outreach or something, and you're doing a report on to, to the pastors and to the church of how open you think the doors would be and how receptive you think they would be to the gospel, it would probably come back with a bunch of thumbs down. It would be a a one or a two out of 10 in any sort of recommendation to go there because they're not going to listen. And this, this is just read the letter. You'd come, you'd come up with pretty much the same conclusion. If you didn't understand the context of the letter is, Oh yeah, a bunch of people got saved and a bunch of churches are getting started and Titus, you need to go and help them get leaders in all these churches because they're, they're mission works that are organizing in city after city after city. And if you didn't know that, you'd look at the people and, and the religious culture and you'd just say, it ain't going to work. And so we'll look at that a little more in detail. Just the supernatural salvation against all odds of, of people getting saved on the island of Crete. So we'll look at relationship between Paul and, and his uh, the evangelist that was there and make application to us, um, our relationship with our evangelist. We'll look at salvation against all odds in, in, in looking at the places we have outreaches, 
here in Oak Harbor uh, and in different parts of the state and the world and think of, you know, it doesn't matter what, what the people are like there, wherever there is, God can save souls. And uh, I, I pray we'd be encouraged by that. And then we'll finish up looking at uh, just tying it in again to our theme from the missions conference, the, the maintenance of good works. And so if you want to have three tidy points for an outline, if you're taking notes, it could be relation, salvation, and preservation. Being, again, relationship and salvation and, and uh, maintenance or preservation of, of good works. So I pray that God would just use our time together tonight, still in, in Titus, to help our thoughts not just stop at the missions conference, which I don't think they, they would, but just to keep that momentum going uh, throughout this year and the, and the coming year for the, the cause of world evangelism. So let's look at this, uh, number one, the relationship. And again, our application in looking at Paul writing to Titus and that relationship would be between us here in Oak Harbor and our evangelistic teams and the individual evangelists and, uh, and their families in the various locations. So in verse 4 of chapter 1 there, as we read, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith, uh, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So just to Titus tells us Paul, as he has, has identified himself in the previous verses, is communicating to Titus. You'd say, yeah, okay. Well, let's just think about that a little more. Paul is uh, obviously a prolific writer to his fellow laborers, wherever they were, a prolific writer to the churches. I mean, he wrote to them so that he could tell them, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, give, give direction and, and all that. We have ones in the Bible in which we hold that the Holy Spirit says, you know, these are going to be part of the canon of Scripture. But you got to believe there were a lot of other letters that Paul wrote to churches and, and to individuals that, that weren't part of, uh, of the Holy Bible, uh, but that he wrote nonetheless. And so he communicated a lot. And I th think about that in his last letter that we have as part of the canon of Scripture, writing to Timothy in his second epistle uh, from prison towards the end of his life. He knew it, and then he talks about running a good race and being a good soldier and all that. And, and he's getting towards the end of Second Timothy uh, specifically in chapter 4 and verse 13, and he says, okay, now when you come, I want you to bring these things. The cloak that I left at uh, Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, uh, and the books, but especially the parchments. And I didn't study this out a whole lot, so uh, God will forgive me if I have the wrong interpretation on whether these were parchments that had already been written on, or was this like a sheet of letter writing paper? The parchments, I need more paper, I need more, well, skin here, I need more writing material because I got a lot more letters to write. I may be in prison, I might not be able to go to all these places and preach, but I can write to this church, and I can write to Titus over here, and I can write to this fellow laborer there, bring me, bring me the, the parchments. So if not the correct interpretation, at least it's a a good application, I believe, in line with the, the character that we understand of, of Paul, especially the parchments. He was a prolific letter writer. Was there a period in your life, maybe not, but maybe your letter writing has done this through the years, was there some period in your life where you were a prolific letter writer? And maybe some would say, no, nope, never, never been there. Maybe older folks, more mature senior saints, and I guess now that I'm 55, I can start to maybe put myself in that category. There was one period in my life when I was a prolific letter writer. I was stationed in Orlando. And the love of my life was stationed <laughs> in her parents' house back in Minnesota. And I wrote some pretty crazy letters. I love crazy letters. And I, don't, I can't remember if she's destroyed them or not. Uh, maybe she saved just one or two of the very special ones to make our children giggle or the grandkids laugh someday. This is what Grandpa said? Really? So there was a time when I wrote a lot of letters. Uh, let me ask you this. Whether you had that experience or not in your past when you wrote a lot, how and how much 
do we communicate just in general today? How much do you communicate and how do you communicate? And uh, older folks would perhaps lament at this point uh, what we've lost in letter writing. Have to admit, I, I don't take pen to paper a whole lot anymore except maybe uh, thank you cards. I try and do that. But if I need to communicate with my mother, for example, and my father, uh, I use other forms of, of communication. So just ask yourself, how much do you communicate? How do you communicate? Just in general, think about how effective it is you are or your communications are. And then let's ask the same question a little more pointedly. How and how much do we communicate with our evangelists? You say, well, someone was just up here making an announcement about a regular monthly scheduled time of communication that the Zawkins do, sitting down uh, about 1 o'clock, you know, after lunch at, in uh, the kitchen, having a time of fellowship and writing out cards to those that we support. So we have, as a church, purposed monthly communications to, or a time for that every month, to communicate with our supported evangelists. Well, let's narrow it down a little more. Do we have, as a church and as individuals, do we have purposed, regular communications with our sent evangelists? And some of you might say, absolutely, on a regular basis, I communicate with, you know, fill in the blank, brother or sister in Fiji, Philippines, Wenatchee. Woe be it for me as a pastor. I'll pick on myself and you can point your finger and then remember, oh, finger's pointing back at me. So don't point him too long. Uh, woe be it for me to, to say anything like, you know, the only time I hear from this outreach, this outreach, that outreach, brother X, Y, or Z, is when they need something. You know, there's a call. It's so-and-so from the field. Oh, they probably need something. Whoa. Maybe that's an indictment on me not having enough communication with our brothers and sisters on the field, just saying, how's it going? And if I did that on a, on a more regular basis, then I would know what's going on, and I wouldn't have to wait for a call from them. So, you know, take that and examine your own life. How much do you communicate, you know? Me, Paul, to you, Titus, letter, writing, communicating. When's the last time you said me, fill in the blank? Writing to you, fill in the blank. How's it going? <laughs> or whatever the communication would be like. So to Titus, two little words, communication. Mine own son. Well, now we have an indication of this family-type intimacy that Paul had with the one that was out there serving on the, on the field. Mine own son. Well, we know, not in the, the physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, we would... Uh, I wouldn't say assume, but uh, would believe the scripture is pointing to the fact that Paul likely had a very strong influence in sharing the gospel with Titus, perhaps being there right when he was uh, spiritually birthed into the family of God. Might have happened. Again, the scriptures uh, don't tell us exactly. But this could have happened when uh, Barnabas went to Tarsus and, and sought out Saul Paul, and when he found him, brought him, brought him into Antioch. This is uh, recorded in Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Uh, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Taught much people. Well, maybe Titus was one of those much people that were taught about the gospel. He got saved and then baptized, discipled there uh, in the church in Antioch. Later on, Titus ministered in Corinth. In fact, if you do a little Google search in your e-sword or my sword or some sort of electronic Bible or you pull out a big, big strong concordance and look up Titus, you'll find him referenced a lot in epistles to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, for example. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us 
by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So here, our text, Titus, Titus is on Crete, Paul's communicating with him. Uh, Prior to that, he likely got saved under Paul in Antioch, and then later on, he's in Corinth, and he's being used as, uh, to uh, uh, encourage the brethren there and bring messages back to himself. Titus was with Paul, it seems, when he was last imprisoned in Rome before leaving to minister in Dalmatia. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, and this is not Titus saying, Paul, you know, you're just in prison. You're never going to get out. I'm, I'm out of here. I just, I don't know about this Christianity stuff. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this was, he was already used in various places. And now he's saying, okay, you know, I want to be an encouragement to you, but there's some other people that need to be saved. Or there's some people that I heard about that were saved in Dalmatia and, and uh, they need to have some things set in order. So Paul, with, you know, with your, your permission, I'm going to go do that. So all this to show uh, just the level of relationship that we get when he writes to him and, he, and just saying, you know, mine own son. Just this, not just communication, hi, how are you doing? It's, oh, my dear son, oh, the relationship that they had. And so uh, by application, I would pray that, that our communications would uh, further that family type of intimacy that we would have with those that are serving on the field. Different details, different circumstances for all of us as various members here in Oak Harbor and your relationships to the various evangelists and their families on the various fields, but there should certainly be some level of family-like intimacy in our purposed communications. So there's, uh, this is all under the broad heading of just relationship, Uh, communication, family intimacy, a unity in faith. He says, uh, after the common faith. Uh, mine own son, after the common faith. So a unity in faith in uh, just the presentation of the gospel, his salvation, a unity there in, in how one is saved, a unity of the faith in, in discipleship. And, and Paul's discipling of Titus at Antioch would now translate to Paul saying, hey, and now I'm going to give you instruction in this letter that that discipling that I did with you in Antioch, now you would use to uh, work with some of the leaders there that are then going to be put in place, ordained as elders in the various churches, that they would teach in the church, and then you get into chapter 2, that the elder men in the church, as they hear from the pulpit uh, how they're supposed to be living and establishing and maintaining good works, then they can pass it on to the younger men, and uh, the aged women can pass it on to the, the younger women, and so on and so on. And so Paul's telling them they need to, they need to have this uh, common faith. There needs to be unity in the faith. Rebuke them sharp, sharply that they may be sound in the faith, uh, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the, the truth. That's in verse 13 and, and 14. So a unity in faith and a unity in, in purpose. Verse number five, for this cause... Uh, there was a purpose that Titus was there. He didn't just say, this is a pretty cool place. I'd like to live here. I'm going to hang out here for a while. <laughs> it was Paul saying, no, you're there for, for a purpose, for a cause. And we're united in that purpose, that cause. Organizing sound churches. Uh, thinking of God's law of spiritual reproduction. Churches are to produce churches. Like produces like. Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor should produce churches that are like Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor. Does that mean identically like us? Well, that's somewhat of an impossibility. Uh, Think about your children or think about our children. (laughs) For those that know the five Geislings, uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five are, are not alike. They both came from the, the same two parents, uh, the same set of DNA, and yet you'd look at just the two boys and you'd say, wow, they're, they're totally different. And you'd look at, when you'd call them for dinner, ha- uh, Hannah, Abby, Becky, it was like one girl, 
Hannah Abbey Becky. Um, but you look at Hannah Ray and, oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble, Abigail Rose, Rebecca Ruth, okay, remember their middle names. If you look at them, even the two twins, wait a minute, they're born at the, from the same two parents at the same time, but they're, they're really not, not alike. So as parents, we would look and say there's a lot of variability between our children, and yet others may be looking at, at five Geislings would say, oh, yeah, I can tell. Andrew and Joel, you don't think they're anything alike, but they're, they're, they're Geists. Or Hannah, Abby, Becky, we'd look at them and say they're all different. Uh, you might look at them and say, oh, yeah, Geist girls, I can tell. That there's what? What is there? Well, they came from the same parents. They spent about 18 plus years living in the same roof, hearing all the same things from the same two parents. There ought to be something that's alike. And so I thought about that as I, I thought about churches reproducing themselves in other churches. And I would venture to say even the various churches, however many were getting organized uh, in the context of this letter on the island of Crete, they were likely evan evangelized by the same people that were there, the same evangelistic team, more or less, roughly the same time period. And yet, a year or two later, after organizing, you think if you visited those cities, that you'd say, you know, this church is the exact spitting image of the church down the road. You probably wouldn't say that, but you might say, oh, yeah, they do this just, just like the church down the road. Why is that? Well, it was the same evangelistic team that taught them that, that came from Bible Baptist Church Antioch, which was started out of Jerusalem and so on and, and so on. So just interesting thought. How about the seven churches of Asia? Same thing there. Uh, all the same parent church or maybe in the same family because it would seem like Antioch perhaps started the church in Ephesus which then you know had a great ministry reaching all of Asia so they were all either daughter churches or grandchild churches from the church in Antioch maybe by way of Ephesus but you go and read chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the revelation of Jesus Christ, seven letters to seven churches, again, all in the same family, if you will, and you find wildly different churches in their strengths and weaknesses and what the Lord has to say to them. So now, all that to say, Paul writing to, to Titus would expect that these churches would have certain things that were just solid bedrock. They, there is, uh, you know, he, he's using pretty harsh language in a direct telling Titus to rebuke them sharply that they be sound in the face. So there was certain things that were rigid and unbending in and other, other things that, I don't know, if in this church the ushers wear plaid ties and this shirt, the church they wear striped ties, that's probably okay. Um, let's go on. And I think I've finished up that point. Yeah, Amen. There's more, but we'll, we'll go on. So relationship or the relation that we have between us and our evangelists and the, uh, their works in various parts of the world. Salvation, supernatural salvation against all, all odds. How do we know that people got saved in Crete? Because they were there to establish churches, Titus was. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city again how many cities we don't know how many churches we don't know more than one i'm even guessing more than more than two but what was the evangelistic environment or if you were to describe your thoughts on the potential receptivity of these people to the seeds of the gospel being planted what would your picture be if you didn't know if you cut out if you redacted the parts of the letter that talked about the fact that they were, act, they were actually Christians there. If you just read all the other parts about the character and flavor of, of this island, what would you come away with? Well, there were false religious teachers there. How do we know that? Verses 9 through 11 of chapter 1. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be, and this is finishing up the qualifications for office of bishop, uh, to be one of these elders that Titus was guiding them to ordain. Uh, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, 
especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. At best, there were those teachers going around that were vain talkers. At best, it was just kind of an empty white noise coming from their mouth. At best. At worst, they were deceiving. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Pretty harsh words from uh, our Lord in Matthew chapter 23 and in verse 15. So vain talkers, empty at best, deceivers at worst, false religions and and cults in areas and countries of uh, places that we have our outreaches. And we could, you know, have our evangelists give us a report. Well, what kind of uh, false teachers are in Wenatchee? What kind of false teachers and, and cults and false religions and vain talkers and, uh, and deceivers are in Fiji, are in Cebu? Some of you have traveled to the, the Philippines and you've shared with me some of the false religions and, and cults that are there. So, on Crete, that's what they had, false teachers. And what about their character to start with? Well, I've been referencing it uh, quite a bit, referring to it. One of themselves, uh, this is verses 12 through 14 of chapter 1, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And I love what Paul says here. This witness is true. (laughs) <laughs> uh, wherefore and then the wherefore rebuke them sharply that they be sound in the faith uh, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that, that turn from uh, the, the truth well think about uh, various cultures various ethnicities uh, certainly exhibiting various aspects of, of bad character everywhere we would go everywhere we try and reach locally uh, everywhere we reach out to in, in our, our outreaches. Uh, I think of uh, just the various factions as I'm uh, learning about them through the communication and those that have been there in, in, in Fiji. You have the Fijians, the native Fijians, I guess. You'd have to go back a ways to f- find out where they initially came from to get there. But you have the native Fijians, you have a large Chinese population, the Bible studies we're, we're hearing about, and then you have the, the Indian population, and, and then some coming from Africa. So even beyond that, there are other uh, ethnicities and uh, religions in there. And it's, it sounds like, from what I've been learning through the years here, that within the various groups, we'll just say the Chinese, the Indians, and the Fijians, uh, that there are certainly some prejudicial leanings and, and feelings ones towards another. And, and uh, Brother Jeremiah and others that have, have been there and ministered have perhaps, well, the sergeant's obviously continuing to have to deal with that, and future laborers, as the Lord would uh, would direct out there, will have to, to deal with that. You, you're trying to see a mission work established, and, and uh, a Fijian gets saved, and a, uh, someone from China gets saved, and someone from India gets saved, and... And now you're trying to put them all together and you'd say, well, the love of God will just make them all one big happy family. Well, prayerfully, maybe even saved. Some of them are looking at other groups unlike their own saying, you know, there's some liars, there's some evil beasts, there's some slow bellies. But you know what? We could generally say that everywhere we're going to go, lost people are going to behave as lost people. And I would say everywhere we go, and share the gospel, starting in our Jerusalem and radiating out to the ends of the earth, we're going to find liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. But you know what? According to this letter, liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies got gloriously saved. And you're looking at me like, and? <laughs> I find that supernaturally miraculous that the Holy Spirit would do this quickening work. God doesn't go around and look for someone you know, they're almost saved. They're they're pretty good person. I'll just do the finishing work. Now they're saved. Because it won't be as uh, hard as, as doing a work of salvation on an evil beast or a, a slow belly 
we're a liar. No. And I, I think that should be encouraging to us, that we hear of the different, the, the fields in the different parts of the world, not just where our evangelists are, although that's primarily the application, but, you know, where we support others in uh, Africa and in Europe and, and elsewhere. Eve, uh, liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies got gloriously saved, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That was writing to a different place, the Corinthians. We'd say, oh, yeah, those Corinthians. Yeah, but there was a church in Corinth too. What about uh, the Ephesians? Were they all men and women of upstanding character when the gospel came to that particular city? Well, Paul wrote to that church, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Uh, That's Ephesians chapter 2, the opening five verses. The Corinthians uh, reference was 1 Corinthians 6, 11. By grace ye are saved, and by grace was the salvation of liars evil beasts, and slow bellies. God saved Cretans, God saves Filipinos, God saves Fijians, God saves Central Washingtonians, God saves Oak Harborites, God saves Freelanders. Oh, that's a tough one now. Let me go back and study that one. I think he might even save a few Minnesotans. In spite of false religious teachers and cult spreading lies in spite of lust pleasing lost lives with the ravages and scars of sin to the praise and glory of of God. I find that encouraging. The more I ponder who the Cretans were, that church after church after church was started there because all these people were gloriously saved. Well, very quickly, We'll tie it into the maintenance of good works. The end of chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it was just the opposite. There were those that were saying, I love God, I follow God, I'm a Christian. But they weren't, and so they weren't doing any good works at all. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works... They deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Well, these are the false professors that would be anywhere we're going to have an outreach, perhaps initially claiming, I'm saved, I want to help you. (laughs) We see that throughout the scriptures, certainly there in Crete, that there were those that claimed they wanted to help, claimed they knew God, but when it came to actually establishing and maintaining good works, they did just the opposite. In actual works, denying God. Abominable. And I'll not go through uh, my list of abominations that the Bible has. We think of uh, the abominals, abominations in, in our culture, for example, And we would maybe be quick to run to sexual sins, the LGBTQ agenda. In Leviticus 18, 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. What about pride? What about lying? Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight as we read the 12th of every month this year in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 22 and On the sixth of every month, we read about the abominations and uh, listed for us there. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And the first one is not sodomy. The first one is a proud look. I'm not being apologetic. You understand that for that lifestyle. I'm just saying 
We do well to examine ourselves and make sure the abominations in our lives are, are cleaned up, examined uh, by the Lord, identified by the Lord, and, and washed by the Lord. A proud look, a lying tongue. So abominable, disobedient, just a simple refusal to submit to authority. A reprobate, their works were not what God wanted to do. Their works were reprobate, unapproved, rejected by a holy God. Bottom line, the false professors are not going to establish and maintain good works. And certainly we would hear testimonies of that as our evangelists work with those that initially claim Christ, but maybe they find out uh, they're professors and not possessors. Well, let's make that final connection to chapter 3. Chapter 2 talks about good works as well. Again, I believe uh, Brother Josh was uh, preaching on that. Um, during the missions conference. So back to chapter 3, verse 8 and 14, and we'll be done. And I would simply point uh, out that there's a distinction, a contrast between verse 8 and verse 14. In that verse 8 references in maintaining good works, they which have believed in God. Uh, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. It would seem in the context of the letter as as a whole, and this verse in particular, that this exhortation to maintain good works is unto those that the evangelists have evangelized, who have received Christ, accepted the gospel, Uh, Again, they which have believed in God, relatively uh, younger Christians in the Lord, babes in Christ. And in dealing with growing babies, uh, it requires a constant affirmation, a constant uh, instruction. It, It requires constant correction, repetition, repetition, repetition to develop and maintain what they need to know and to develop and maintain what they need to do. Doctrine and church polity and our labors and the ministries unto the Lord that seem to be intuitive in Oak Harbor are only so because of the repetition repetition in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible Training Institute this week, over and over and over again. Repetition, repetition, repetition. You say, oh, I've heard that before. And yet the end result is when you hear something that's doctrinally, ah, maybe not right, uh, church polity-wise, in practice, ah, that's really not the, the, the principle and the pattern that the, the Lord has laid out for us in his scripture. It just seems natural to you. Why? because of the constant affirmation and the repetition in the teaching. And he says that's what they need in these various young churches on Crete, part of the instruction. So verse 8 seems to have that target audience in mind for maintaining good works, establishing and maintaining the good works, these relative new believers. But it's interesting, uh, down in verse 14, it seems to be contrasted with well, compared, the good works again, but contrasted in the target audience. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me, uh, starting in verse 12, sorry, uh, to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Verse 13, bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Again, verse 8, they which have believed in God. Newer believers at these outreaches that we reach out to evangelistically. Here, ours also. And what is the context? Evangelists that are coming from the field and meeting up with Paul. Uh, Evangelists that Paul is sending to that field or, or other fields. Really, all the evangelistic laborers who are reaching out to see folks um, evangelized. 
So the exhortation there seems to be more with the evangelistic team and really going all the way back to the sending church, uh, which should be evangelizing where they are, back, back in Antioch, for example. For necessary use, uh, uses that they be not unfruitful. Why that they be not unfruitful? Well, because the heavenly husbandman desires fruit. And we looked at that before the missions conference, one of the last messages. John chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Again, tying this into verse 14, that they be not unfruitful. Why? Because the heavenly husbandman desires fruit, and more fruit, and much fruit. And the heavenly husbandman receives glory in much fruit. John 15 and verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So in this book, this letter, this epistle, that Paul from his heart wrote to Titus, let us see in Crete, whether you've been there or not, a contextual illustration of the fields of our Baptist outreaches and in application for all of us, pressing forward out of our missions conference into the new missions year. May we keep our heart beating for the cause of world evangelism through the relationships that we have and maintain through communication with our evangelists, our evangelistic teams, their families on the field, through never doubting that God can supernaturally save a soul anywhere where we are ministering, regardless of how hard the people might seem there, and that we would build and maintain good works and do so with new believers as they're saved here and abroad, and that we too, older, more mature saints that are laboring in the Lord, would maintain good works. The preceding message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. You can find additional information about the church and our publications ministry on the web at bbcoakharbor.org. For further assistance with specific questions, please feel free to give us a call at area code 360-675-8311. Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that you received a blessing from the preaching of God's word.